Your voice, your opinion, your community. Fact TV, free speech, protected. I'm Robert McBride, and this is Everyday People, a program in which we investigate the lives of people making a difference in our community. This is Robert McBride with another episode of Everyday People, talking with people from our local community making a difference. And on today's program, we have Scott Morgan, who is a local artist, been a local artist in Bellows Falls now because he's lived here a good long time, but from other parts of the country, and we'll get into his background. So welcome to the show. Thank you. Yeah. Good to be here. Yeah. Well, we can sort of start backward. Right now, um, for the last month and a half, Scott has uh, some work hanging at the Project Space Nine Gallery, which is a small gallery in the Exner block, right down off the square, between the square and heading towards the train station. And that's open from eight to five, seven days a week. So you can go in and take a look at his work. It'll be up until the end of the month. And other than that, he's got a finger in lots and lots of different pies. And so tell us about your, you have a studio here in Bellows Falls, but how long have you been in Vermont? let's say, because we're interested in Vermont artists. I moved here in 2008 from Seattle. Uh -huh. So 12 years now and started out in Chester. Yeah. And But I always had a connection with Bellows Falls and started with uh, the Great River... Great River Arts. Great River Arts. Yep, yep. In 30, at 33 Bridge Street. Yeah. And then Chris Sherwin brought me into his studio, gave me a home there. So I've been with Chris in, at Sherwin Art Glass for nine or ten years now yeah tucked in there and then there's we have a rehearsal space and he's brewing beer back there and it's and then we have another glass blower around the corner so it's been a great great to have yeah. the camaraderie and be with other artists yeah, yeah no 33 so. bridge streets is really come together in a nice way well it's the home of will fm radio station black mm -hmm. sheep radio charlie hunter has a studio there and uh mark pipcorn does the 33 stage 33 mm -hmm performances and then Chris has been there a long time yeah and then Nick from Suga Suga Studios and also the glass blowers moved in and then um, we do host artist town meetings quarterly ramp and we actually have the next one coming up next Thursday the 12th from 6 to 8 which you're invited to attend it's a potluck and it goes from 6 to 8 at 33 Bridge Street and then it will also be the site of a lot of people's artwork for the open studio weekend at the end of May which we'll probably have another program on Great. So what? So have you had studio spaces before in your different places, or did you sort of get heck out of studio space at home? Or yeah, well, when I lived in Seattle, I had a uh, detached garage. Uh -huh. I bought bought a house just for that garage that I could turn into a studio. But I also participated in some uh, cooperative building, uh, artist buildings. Um, in Seattle, there's a lot more of that. A lot more of that because most people don't have, as they do here, they don't have land and they don't have a barn. Right. So people do tend to congregate together in these old, broken-down buildings downtown, and it's a that's really cool. Yeah. So I, I kind of missed doing that. So when I got here and I met Chris and saw what was going on in the building, I, I was really, really intrigued by that yeah. and excited yeah. to be a part of that. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit, I, I know you, you, do you have a connection to Florida? Because I know you sometimes go down there. Did you live there? Yeah, I grew or up You grew up there. Yeah. So you sort of have these coast connections. Yeah, I've been to every corner, but now I need to move to the southwest corner because <laughs> I've been Florida to Seattle <laughs> right. to here. But I never, I grew up here when I was really young. I lived in Poughkeepsie, New York. My, ah, my yeah. family are New Yorkers. Okay. But I was young when I moved to Florida. Right. Moved to Daytona Beach. Right, right, right. So I've never really lived in the Northeast till recently yeah. as an adult, and it's I'm really uh, getting quite the education <laughs> about it. Lately, I'm right. dealing. I have a part-time job dealing with all the snow, so that's I feel like a real <laughs> Vermonter now. You are totally. Yeah. And so, in these different communities you've lived as being an artist and as you've matured as an artist. Um, were you lucky enough to always sort of hook into a community of artists in those places? And, and, and did you find that was sort of absolutely necessary to help you feel supported or not? Or 
you know? Cause yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. When I came here, that's, that's desperately what I was missing and needed. And I went right for it. You know, it takes a little mm -hmm. bit of effort, but I, f I networked pretty quickly with uh -huh. other artists here and it's been a great thing. Yeah. Art, Cause I'm, I'm also a musician. So right. I've always sort of grad graduated towards the artists and uh, musicians in the community. Right. Yeah. Right. So was the would it, was it one of those first the music came and then you started painting or did you always sort of parallel them or what? For me, for me, it, it's, there's been a rhythm of back and forth. I started out not so much as an artist, but I was uh, studied to be a landscape architect. Ah. So my first experiences with drawing were really with drafting mm -hmm. and lots of pencil and ink and. I was always the guy in the office that volunteered to do the perspective sketches uh -huh. and, and use magic marker and I thought, oh, this is kind of cool and yeah. maybe I could get into some painting and, and there's also a lot of design involved in what I did, uh, but it was, there was always a lot of compromising when, you're, when you have a job like that right. with budget and being democratic about things and so, uh, so I would go home at night feeling a little less than fulfilled and I would start, I got into music, I got into trying to do a little painting, and so I'm pretty much self-taught right. as a painter. Right. But it comes from, from the drawing mm -hmm. and some of the hand skills and, from, uh, and then also the music influence has been a big part of what I do. And, right, right. Mm -hmm. And have you generally worked abstractly? Yes, as, yeah. as, a, mm -hmm. s s as a professional I have. Mm -hmm. I always had... As a hobby, I would go out and paint sunflowers and do a lot mm -hmm. of plein air painting right. to sort of train myself how to do things. And I did study a lot of Van Gogh and some of those classic right. impressionists and even did copies of Van Gogh's sunflowers to learn how to use the paint. Mm -hmm. um, but what was the question? No, abstractly. Oh, yeah, because yeah. so, yeah, I mean, I'm a painter and yeah. I, I mean, I, I you know, went to the college and stuff. But, you know, from the time I started painting, I just painted abstractly. Oh, yeah. No, I wanted to be, I wanted to just be a great landscape painter, yeah. but then I found that my landscapes were, were decent, but I really wasn't uh, separating myself from the crowd. Mm -hmm. And also one day I, I, I stumbled on an abstract painting class. I really didn't know much about it. I hadn't studied art history. I was not an art major. I was right. a landscape architecture right. major. And where was that? Where that was you? in uh, University of Florida. Oh, great. Uh, Gainesville. Yeah. Yep. Gators. Yeah. Yep. Gators. And... Uh, so when I discovered abstract painting, I, I played with that a little bit, and I thought, yeah, this is this is definitely for me. It, it's been yeah. it's been perfect for me because it's it's um, it it just lets me experiment and create a dialogue and play with design and use all the things that, that mm -hmm. are intuitive to me. Mm -hmm. Whereas when I start to do portraits and landscapes, I can get a little hung up. Mm -hmm. And and now when I try to do a landscape. Yeah. Even halfway through it, I'll turn it upside down and turn it into an abstract. Right, 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 right. It's just, it's, those compositions feel, feel uh, right. more intuitive to me. And well, I know when I paint, because I paint abstractly. Um, you know, I'm also not painting for someone to see something in a very specific way. You know, it doesn't have that referential thing. So I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. creating work and I step back and forth. And, you know, obviously over the years I've developed a vocabulary and a technique. It's not like I'm in some trance and just throwing paint at the canvas, which right. is fine too, but I mean, right. but you know, but it's, it's, it's a language that's evolved, you know, and, exactly. and stuff. And, uh, and I, I sometimes think sometimes if you're tied to something too figuratively, it, it just, it's, 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 an, it's art, I get it, but mm -hmm. I, I really love the freedom of the abstraction, like you yeah, were mentioning. I agree. And the ability, and I, and I don't know if you tend, how you tend to work in your studio, do you tend to work on one piece of work at a time, or do you kind of jump from pieces of work at that you're working on, or I tend to stick with one piece. Uh -huh. Yeah, from beginning to end, you kind of bring it through. Yeah, and then there's some that do. I think they're done, and I leave them on the mm -hmm. side, and then maybe they need a little more yeah, work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or someone will tell me, "Is that done?" I'm like, "Okay, maybe yeah, it's not." Right. You know. Yeah. But I also like being distracted and, and interrupted in the middle of a painting sometimes, and I was going to continue, and now with this distraction, I realize, "Oh, wait a minute, yeah, that's that's done." Right. Right, yeah. right. So you, you know, you, your work over the years has also spread beyond the canvas, you know. And I, you know, I see you've brought some guitars in with you that you have.
painted on. Yeah. I don't know if you want to maybe grab one and but grab describe one. it um, if we are on the radio also to kind of uh, verbally yeah. describe it. Well, this has been a really fun sort of um, side project to as a musician to to paint these mm -hmm. really organic canvases. It's it's really fun to do. Fantastic, um, yeah. And uh, I'm often commissioned by musicians to do their guitars, and it's it's been really fun. This is an acoustic guitar, and I do, this is a playable guitar, but I also do guitars that are um, not players anymore. I recondition them, and they're just, they're just fine art, mm -hmm. and people really seem to enjoy those. And, and like, what, so tell us a so little about is, the paint you so use yeah, and this, the process of putting it onto the wood. Well, typically my work on canvas is oil. Okay. But the, these, are, these are acrylic. Okay. So I would tend to... This is actually the first time I've done a playable acoustic because I was worried that the paint would affect the acoustics of the That's what I was going to ask you about. Yeah. But on, on electrics, I tend to paint them. It's not a problem. But So I would, I would, find it, I would take the old finish off okay. or sand it down, and then I, I would prime it like a regular canvas with white gesso or white primer and then go to work. And, yeah, this is... I really enjoy the way this came out. It was fun. And I always, as I do with my canvas, I like sort of wrap the... Yeah. Wrap the painting around right. the sides. Exactly. So, so were you saying that you, the paint can affect the acoustics of the of the guitar? I, I thought it or, would, but they they haven't really. Uh -huh. Yeah. Right. They're they're so well made nowadays that so they just can they can handle it. Now this of course is electric, so the the paint doesn't hurt it at all. Right. Right. And um, and I have some local. I, I I work with some local luthiers to set up the guitar so it plays well. And also to uh, sometimes apply a nice glassy finish to it. So there's a few people mm -hmm. in the area that I, I collaborate with. And I'm always looking for other uh, guitar builders to work with. Right. So that's, that's just been a fun side, side project. And so, um, and how, do they, how does the paint hold up? It's, I mean, it's as a, you get the involvement of the patina, the person using their yeah, hand on the yeah, guitar they're, every year. They may get some good scratches in yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. yeah but cool. guitar players love that. I yeah. mean, that's, that's a thing now to get yeah. a distressed guitar. So. And do you, do you paint them differently um, if you, like, say you have a guitar that you know no one's going to buy to play, if you're using it more as an object like you used a canvas, mm -hmm. as opposed to someone's going to take this guitar and play it? Do you, do you treat that any differently? No. No, okay. No. Okay, no, no. no, no. And, it's like, you know. No, I typically, especially with these electric guitars that have a lot of components on them, I right. try to pay homage to the shape of the guitar and the components and bring that all into to right. the design. Because design, as, as much as I like to do, as much as I enjoy abstract painting, there definitely is a design component, Absolutely. as you know. I, that maybe in the beginning I play around and make a big mess, but then I start to go to work and reinforce right. certain shapes and create dialogues in the forms right. and use some design right. in, in composing. So I do that, especially with the guitars. Right. Um, that's, that's really cool, that's yeah. fun. And just my own ignorance perhaps, but so electrical guitars, are those usually plastic-based materials or are they wooden also, like a regular guitar? The body be? of the guitar? Yeah. They're wood, in they, fact. Okay, um, interesting. I may have, I don't know if I have, gave, gave a sample, but Often, I'm working on a guitar right now for Chris Sherwin at uh -huh. Sherwin Art Glass yeah. that, that has the top of the guitar is a quilted maple. Whoa. So that will be, rather than paint that, I'll dye it. Uh -huh. And it'll be a transparent design that you'll see. You'll still see the grain right through the design, mm -hmm. uh, through the paint, through mm -hmm. the dye. And, but typically, the guitars are wood, some type of wood or exotic yeah. wood. Yeah. So also, you know, because, in a, and I've run into this problem, and maybe many artists do, because you, you have a variety of ways that you apply your work, you know, whether it's the guitar, whether it's the canvas, whether it's this. I've often noticed when I have people in my studio, because I often paint onto furniture and stuff too, that they can't quite get the, it sometimes becomes distracting to them. Yeah. You know what I mean? Do you find that you sometimes need to, someone's coming to your studio, we're just going to show paintings. We're not going to do this. Or yeah. if you're going to an exhibit or a trade show, because mm -hmm. otherwise people are like, well, well, what do you do? You know. So I mean, I yeah, I usually don't have that problem. I love it that someone could do a ton of things, but some people can't quite grasp yes. what they're seeing, and you have to really focus yeah. them. I learned my lesson about that because Look. I got real excited because some of these guitars have sold as art. Even the playable, expensive electric ones have sold as art to, to people. Right. It's sort of bittersweet because they don't play them. Right. They just wanted to hang them up in their living room, right. which is a beautiful thing. 
but it's very attractive. It's bright and shiny and it's different, it's unique. And I got excited and I, I made a bunch of them and brought them to an art festival and it took all the attention away from the canvases and people just wanted to play them and talk about their grandma's guitar and right. their, their kids' guitar lessons. So it was a bit of a distraction. Yeah. But I really, I really enjoy making them and it, it's sort of a, an opportunity for me to find another niche of, of customers as well. Right. And, and to meet some great new right. people too. So. Right. Well, it's also not, I mean, your style is consistent. You know, there's some people mm -hmm. that their style that actually changes yeah. when they're doing different things, which can even get more confusing to put out. But yours, you know, even if you did go somewhere, yeah. there's a cons there's a consistent look to your artwork. Right. And that's Whether it's that's on the guitar, whether yeah. it's on the canvas, or whether it's on something else. That's challenging because people have asked me to do illustration type right. work on their guitar or right. on a canvas as well. Can you do can you do a picture of me with my Boston hat or Boston right. Red Sox right, cap? Right, right, like, right. No, I'm not really an illustrator. I yeah. wish I wish I could. I, yeah. Yeah. Believe me, but I, I don't do that very well. Well the other thing that's great is and, and this conversation comes up a lot at our artist town meetings and we talk to people is that, you know, we all know being an artist is a struggle economically, financially, you know, to really make it. And also living in Vermont is difficult. In one sense, Vermont is mm. wonderful because it's inspirational and you can have a lot of connection with people. But on the other hand, you know, it's not a huge art market. There's a small demographic of people. So, you know, in your struggle to survive, you know, you do different things. Mm. But also, I know you've, you've really reached out and sort of um, participated in different kinds of art festival or trade show kind of things. And so... To want to tell the audience a little bit about that, like you know, how did you, did you say I just got to go do this, or how did you yeah. sort of select the ones you thought, and maybe a couple of things you've learned as lessons, like well, I wouldn't do that again, but I would yeah. still do this because you can never count on what's going to happen at one of those That's true. events, whether That's true. someone comes from nowhere and it's fantastic, or you sit there for a whole day and you know it's yeah. hard, it's 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 really a hard thing to do. So some of the, your wisdom well, shared this is would be really the, cool. Probably a longer conversation, I know, but but but, we'll, but, it, but yeah, you know, I think one reason that one reason that artists do art shows is typically if you do a gallery, you're just waiting for someone to walk into the gallery, yeah. and this is a little more of a proactive approach when you do an art festival or an art show. You can you can bring it to what's guaranteed to be a thirty thousand or seventy thousand seventy thousand uh, customers and showgoers can or come or in for yeah. that weekend. So. I've always thought, you know, theoretically, it's a great idea. Yeah. And I thought, well, the bigger the shows, and in the in the locations where there's more money, go down to, you know, it's go down to Connecticut or wherever. But that hasn't always worked for me. Mm -hmm. And as a fine artist at an arts and craft show, it's been a little difficult and challenging to be selling high-priced work or even medium-priced work next to the guy selling kombucha and uh, uh -huh. $20 earrings and things like that. It's a little right. challenging. So I think as an artist, you have to think about where, where you want to be, what kind of show you want to be at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I've had sort of a break-even approach at shows, mm -hmm. um, uh, results, break-even mm -hmm. results. Last year, doing a really big show in Boston that was beautiful, and I felt really honored to be there. So mm -hmm. that was the best part. And I did happen to sell a nice piece that paid for the show. Great. So, Fantastic. So that was successful. Yeah. Yeah. And I was in the company of there were Picassos and Monets wow. and Klimps and and Gox. Yeah, Gauss. yeah there, were, there were there were there was yeah, a yeah cool. Uh, I was I was at the bottom end and pricing for a change. There were yeah. there was a couple of million dollar pieces there. Yeah, wow. Yeah, it was really really nice to be a part of. Yeah. But now I'm refocusing on mm -hmm. more online sales through social networking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We'll see how that works. Yeah. No, no, that's that's really, it's really important. And I know at our next Artist Town meeting next Thursday, we are going to talk about some social networking and Instagram and stuff yeah. like that too. But it's mm -hmm. just such a, there's so much out there yeah. and there's so many ways you got to do it. And, you know, it's it's sort of like, I just want to be in my studio working I know, too. I'm, you know, it's yeah. like. And I've know, always had to, being in Vermont, as you said, it's yeah. tough. And I've always had to to supplement my work with uh, part-time work. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Landscaping, gardening, painting houses, yep. all that stuff. Right, right, right. But right now, I'm, I'm, I'm still seeking ways to monetize my work so, mm -hmm. that I can, so that I can get in the studio right. and paint more. Right. And one of the things I'm looking at, which I've almost got wrapped up now, is a way to offer financing for my larger paintings. Mm. Um, oh. So people can go on the website and they can choose to do some 
zero interest, 12 month payments on, oh, on a painting. Right. Yeah. Right. And uh, and also, as I mentioned before, I'm I just connected with a company out of Montreal that makes beautiful women's clothing, uh -huh. and will put the designs of my work on the clothing, and right. they're gorgeous. I'm excited yeah. about that. Too. Right. Right. Just offering. Yeah. Uh, different price points, yep. different different products, but it's it's still my imaging, it's still my work, and it's my design, and uh, I'm happy to see see it on however people want it. Canvas, right. guitars, right. clothing, doesn't matter. I know, it's great, because like, yeah. people wearing it and walking through space yeah. is like totally fantastic. The best. You yeah. know, it really is. Yeah, I'm really about great. to order a dress for my daughter and uh -huh. see, see how that works. Oh, cool. yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So, and do you find that, you know, Vermont works for you as a place? You know, I mean, not just as an artist, but you're, you feel like, you know, are you getting ready to head to the Southwest and hit that other corner, man? Or no, I'm, I'm good here. I just missed the, I'm an ocean person, uh, so I'm a little bit landlocked, but I get two hours over the coast and I go right. surfing over there and right. I just bought a nice paddle board, so uh -huh. I find my way to the water, right. but otherwise it works. It's mellow. It's a good place to make work for sure. Right. It's right. been a little tougher to sell work in Vermont, right. but I always thought, well, I'm only two or three hours, four hours to right. Boston and close to New York. That will be easy there. Yeah. You really almost have to live there to yeah. make an art career there. Yeah. And a lot of it's like just being out there and and yeah. the coincidence of stuff that happens. You know, you do quality work. So we, I just want to mention again, we're talking to Scott Morgan here. And also Scott, uh, he currently has a show that will be up at the Exner Block in Project Space 9 Gallery right at 9 Canal Street. It's open seven days a week from 9 to 5. And you can see a good group of his paintings there. And... Um, Tell us about, you know, give us your website address yeah, and ways right. to do it. And uh, yes, we'll talk about okay. that too. Thank um, you. <laughs> you can find me at watermusicart.com. That's the easiest way okay. to type in those three words together. Water, music, art. Those are the big influences in my life. So, And you can find me that same way, Water, Music, Art, on Facebook, my Facebook page, uh, on Instagram, Twitter. It's all Water, Music, Art. Yeah. 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 And, and come see me at Bridge Street. Yeah, yeah, he's Bridge over Street. 33 Bridge Street. Doors often open. If his right. doors open to his studio, you keep going straight back in the building. And that's where Chris Sherwin's studio is and a bunch of others. And Scott was nice enough to point out on my little checkoff list of things is that um, Ramp is having its uh, 20th annual, um, no, 13th annual art raffle auction, which is will take place March 29th, Sunday, at Flatiron Exchange Cafe on the square. And local artists, including um, Scott, have donated their work. There's about 40 pieces of artwork. They're currently hanging at the cafe all month. And there's in information about that and stuff at that. But stop by, support Flatiron, take a look at you know local artists' work, and come to the raffle on the 29th of March. So, Scott, do you have any other exhibits or shows coming up that we should know about or share with the public? Anything like in the fall, I'm going to go do this, or... I mean, you had some work that's currently also up at um, Moondog Cafe, mm -hmm. but is that coming down? That's coming down probably Monday. Next couple of days. But, you know, Monday. go over and have a coffee and look yeah. at some of his work right across the street up at Moondog from the Exner Block. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for being on the you. program. Come on back again. And if you think of some other people you'd like to have a program about with, let's, let's put it together. Thanks for having me. It was yeah. great. So um, I want to thank Back TV for being such an incredible resource. Uh, for hosting programming like this that can take place on the community level. And I want to thank the Vermont Arts Council, the National Endowment for the Arts, as well as Chroma Technology and um, the Wyndham Foundation and Stewart Property Management uh, down at the Exeter Block for helping support RAMP and all you individuals that also help support RAMP. So come on over to the show at the um, cafe at the Flatiron. And uh, till the next show and see you on the square, this is Robert McBride. Thank you. Thank you.